100% of us were affected by public agency decisions made during the pandemic. Today, we have a unique opportunity to talk to one of the most senior health officials and public faces of the pandemic response to get an insider view into the past, present, and future of how we respond to disease globally. I'm your host, Alex Maersperger, and in season three of our podcast and YouTube series, we celebrate those changing healthcare and life sciences for the better. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Redfield, virologist and former director of the CDC from the all important years of 2018 to 2021 and current senior advisor to Governor Hogan and the state of Maryland for public health. Welcome, Dr. Redfield. Thank you, Alex. Glad to be here. Please, uh, Dr. Redfield, please catch us up on what you've been up to in the past 12 months after your time at the CDC. Well, it was a great honor to be given the opportunity to, to lead CDC. Uh, I didn't uh, really know at the time I went down there that it was going to be so eventful, uh, although I did have a premonition that uh, our nation was uh, very vulnerable to a pandemic. I thought it was going to be a bird flu pandemic. Uh, and so obviously it was just readjusting back into life after really, a, you know, a 14 to 20 hour a day, seven day a week job. Uh, you know, working with really over 20,000 outstanding young men and women that really work each day to try to protect the public health of this nation. Uh, what I've done since is I'm obviously a senior advisor for Governor Hogan in public health in America, to, in Maryland, to keep me engaged in um, public health policy. I've also started a company whose job it uh, goal it is is to try to facilitate the uh, distribution of vaccines, initially COVID vaccines, to resource resource poor and moderate income countries. It's very disappointing to me that despite the enormous scientific advancement that we made with Operation Warp Speed, and it was a great honor to be part of that and be on that board, is that really more than 80% of the world still lacks access to the COVID vaccines in, in an effective way. Some of them got a single vaccination, but they're really very limited effective vaccine. So I'm working to try to uh, help countries build uh, an effective, sustainable, scalable vaccine strategy. So I'm spending quite a bit of time on that. And then, and then doing some strategic advisory positions for uh, different biotech and public health companies. So I'm staying busy. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's obviously different than uh, the forty plus years I spent in public service. Yeah, it sounds like those eighteen hour days might be down to seventeen and a half. <laughs> the only advantage is I can control the nine holes of golf that I want to fit in during the week whenever I want to do it. There you go. You uh, you spoke about some of the challenges uh, encountered, and I'm sure you encountered many sort of armchair quarterbacks who weighed in on what health leaders could have done different or better during COVID response. In a recent speech, you talked about how not everything is broken. And so not everything is a challenge. There's incredible ongoing work in outbreak investigations, chronic diseases, environmental health, birth defects. Can you tell us more about what's going right in the world of public health? Well, I would start by just saying, you know, despite the enormous amount of criticism, most of which I don't think is justified, the CDC is really a, a, an excellent organization of dedicated uh, public health uh, uh, healthcare professionals. As I said, there's over 20,000 uh, that work every day to try to protect the public health. I will say, and I've testified before Congress on this on multiple occasions, uh, CDC has been ha hampered by the fact that the United States has not appropriately proportionally invested in public health in, in the United States. Really, the, the amount of investment in public health, I look at it as uh, highly inadequate. And uh, when you realize that CDC forms the basis of funding the public health, not just at the federal level, but we fund the public health in each of the states, the territories, the tribal uh, and the local health departments, it's really highly inadequate. And I argued that it was time for the United States Congress to appropriate the resources, not only that our our nation needs for a, an effective public health system, but actually that the citizens of our nation deserve. And I will say still at this date, 
uh, the public health is extremely underfunded. I gave one example, which is just uh, one area that I pushed hard, was it's hard to have a public health response if you don't have data in real time. I, I tell the story about my first briefing when I was CDC director uh, in, in April of uh, 2018. I got a briefing on what at the time was the number one uh, epidemic that I was asked to lead a response to at CDC, and that was opioid deaths, fentanyl deaths, uh, drug use disorder deaths. You know, as an ID virologist, I thought when I went there, I'd be working on infectious disease. And the first one I had was this drug-related death. And it's very personal to me. I've mentioned to this. I've almost lost one of my three, my three sons uh, from fentanyl that was contaminating cocaine. Uh, I think it's a miracle, and thank God every day, that he's now seven years in recovery. It was a, it was an eye-opening journey. But when they briefed me on the deaths, and we were losing 80,000 people, uh, that year, when you now know it's up over 100,000, it's a lot of people. To put it in perspective, I remind people we lost somewhere between 53 and 57,000 people in Vietnam from the 1950s through the 1970s, and yet now we're losing 80,000 people in a year, mostly young, uh, say under the age of 45. And they briefed me and gave me a great briefing, very accurate, scientifically very useful. And I asked them what the data was through for how this epidemic was going through our nation that we were now putting lots of resources into. And they said the data was through March 2015. And I said, but it's April 2018. And they said that, you know, director, I don't think you understand the complexity that we have at the federal level, getting the states to report the data. Um, so, and, and I did say, and I'm, I, I think some of them were not happy with my response, uh, and they probably don't even want me to repeat it, but I continue to repeat it because I think it's a critical issue. I said what I, when I came to CDC, I thought I was going to lead this agency to make meaningful public health impact. And what you're telling me is really what I'm becoming is a medical historian. And so reality is that. And I went to Congress and asked for uh, data modernization for our public health system in America. Uh, which I was successful in getting some uh, funding that began and continues, but it still wasn't proportional. I wanted more like $25 billion to redo the public health system reporting system in America. And I think the initial appropriation was for like $300 million. I tried to uh, express to Congress that my own hospital system here in one little city of Baltimore uh, spent over a billion dollars upgrading their computer systems uh, for healthcare. So, you know, for the United States to, to cover the entire nation and to invest a modernization act that wasn't proportional, you know, like $300 million wasn't proportional. So I will say one of the challenges, and you're seeing it right now in general in public health, it's hard to respond if you don't have real life data in real life time. So I do think that's one of the real holes in the system that needs to be uh, uh, you know, address. The other one was you need to have public health laboratory resilience. When we developed the original testing for COVID, we developed it based on a platform that the health departments had. It was a platform that was developed for flu. It was a, a low uh, input platform that could maybe do 30 to 50 tests in a laboratory a day. Uh, and what we really needed to have in those laboratories is what we call high throughput uh, laboratories with resilience in both uh, equipment as well as te technicians that were trained to run that equipment. None of that's really in place. The other thing that's still very, very underfunded is the public health workforce. I mean, I had some states when the COVID pandemic started and we were diagnosing people with symptomatic disease and trying to do contact tracing and quarantine. I had some states that had less than 50 people in their public health workforce. Wow. Uh, and so the whole public health infrastructure in this country uh, is very inadequately um, supported by Congress. And I'm, you know, I'm concerned that Congress has a short memory. Uh, you know, Senator Alexander and I talked about this a lot, Senator Blunt and I talked about this a lot, that we wanted to get this funding up while people were still seeing the impact of the pandemic because once the pandemic and they get back to life as usual, uh, the interest in funding that may not be there. I do agree with, uh, 
you know, uh, some of my congressional uh, colleagues and friends now that would try to acknowledge to the American public, and I do believe this to be true, it's not hyperbole, the United States is at much greater threat in its way of life and security from a public health threat than we are from Korea, Iran, uh, China, and, and Russia. And we ought to invest proportionally to that threat. And unfortunately, our nation still hasn't done that. I appreciate all that uh, you covered there. And just want to say seven years in recovery is certainly something to celebrate. So glad to hear that for your son and for your family. Yeah, it should be the rule for everybody. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very disappointed. Uh, the complexity of it uh, was not easy. Uh, I'm very thankful to my son for his courage. And I'm very thankful to God. I always remind my son that it was God that really healed him, not his father and mother. Um, but I am disappointed that so many people in our nation that are struggling with drug use disorder and you could extrapolate that to mental illness because much of drug use disorder is really driven by people self-medicating for underlying mental use disorder, whether they have mood swing disorder, bipolar disorder, depression. Um, and, uh, and I really think that uh, our nation needs to do much, much more to make sure there's uh, universal access to high quality care for uh, for uh, drug treatment disorder and for mental illness. And uh, it would be to our nation's great, great, great benefit uh, if we could make drug treatment and recovery the rule rather than the exception. Amen to that. You, uh, you talked about just all of the areas of opportunity for investment. One area that it seems that at least from a, a newsworthy cycle that you didn't really hear about before that I think now the public is, is facing a lot is diagnostic testing. It really hasn't been in the news or investment cycle. And now you hear about some innovation and investment coming out in finding new diseases or being able to uh, easily see them much faster or more accurately. In the diagnostic market, what innovation and investment is underway that can change the outcome of the way we look at and treat diseases? Well, I give you the example. I mean, part of the challenge when uh, COVID started, one of the first real critical errors uh, was that um, the scientific community and public health community chose to call COVID SARS-like. And that really drove the initial public health response in January, February. It took until March that Ambassador Burks and I really tried to shift the focus because SARS was a virus that when it infected humans caused symptomatic illness. And so what it meant was you could focus on looking for humans with symptoms and then you could basically do your contact tracing isolation around that. Uh, but SARS, uh, but COVID is not SARS-like because a majority of COVID is not symptomatic, it's asymptomatic. So when we set up the original screening that we did, we screened people for symptoms as they were coming back into the country. I had originally about 14 cases of uh, uh, COVID that we uh, diagnosed the last two weeks in January in the first couple, two or three weeks of February. And from those 14 cases, CDC and the public health uh, uh, system within our nation evaluated over four, uh, over 800 contacts. And of those 800 contacts, we only demonstrated that two had COVID. Interesting. So a lot of people, including myself with that data, because the Chinese had affirmed that they had no evidence of human to human transmission, that this virus was not being transmitted in the hospital that it just reinforced that this virus was SARS-like and really didn't know how to go human to human. We could focus on symptomatic disease. And both of those two cases were actually spouses of index cases. But had we tested people rather than it interviewed them for symptoms, I think we would have found a significant number of those contacts were infected. And it wasn't until March that Ambassador Burks and I realized that this was not SARS-like, 
This was a, its own virus, COVID-19. It was highly transmissible asymptomatic. And the key to a public health response was not interviews and contact tracing. The key to the public health response was accelerated diagnostics. Now, there was a problem with that. And I was in the White House in, in March when the president brought all the uh, diagnostic companies to the Roosevelt Room and we had a meeting, Roche, Abbott, you know, LabCorp, Quest, they all were there, uh, Thermo Fisher, um, because we needed them to get fully engaged. And one of the questions was, why weren't they engaged already? And that goes back to the fact that this was called SARS-like and MERS-like, uh, because when SARS happened in 2003, uh, the private sector jumped in to develop diagnostic tests. And guess what happened? It went away. There was less than 1,000 cases. There was, no, there was no market for SARS testing. So then when MERS came uh, back in 2012, 2013, the private sector jumped in again. And guess what happened? No MERS. No market again. So there was one exception. And I think it's a great example to answer your question. It's a long way to answer your question. But the one exception was Korea. Because Korea, back in the late uh, uh, 2000, I can't remember the date exactly. I'm going to guess it was 2016, 17, 18 timeframe. Korea imported a case of MERS in someone that shared a smoking room from someone from the Middle East. And that individual came back to Seoul, Korea. And when that was done, there was several hundred cases of MERS. It was several billion, I think almost $10 billion worth of economic loss shutting down Seoul, all because they were trying to figure out how to contain MERS. Now, luckily for all of us, MERS, like SARS, doesn't know how to go human to human. Uh, luckily, you know, MERS, like SARS, the way to diagnose it symptomatically is really very good. But what Korea did was form a private public partnership with the diagnostic company at that time. So that when SARS, when uh, COVID came, they were able to activate that private public partnership and they were re really able to bring testing on board very, very rapidly. Unfortunately, that wasn't accomplished in the United States and Europe and other parts of the world. So very slow. I used to argue with my friend and colleague, Brett Gerard, who was in charge of testing for the country, and he would tell the world every day how many tests we did. And I would say, Brett, that's not the right question. The question is not how many tests we did. The question is how many tests do we need? Hey. And, you know, and I was a big advocate that we needed about a billion tests a month uh, if we wanted to launch an optimal public health response that needed to be grounded in diagnostics, all right? And so clearly that's why I said about the public health infrastructure, besides the data system, the other system that needs to be augmented is the capacity of our public health system to do diagnostics. When the pandemic happened, and I once you know realized that our platform was low volume 30 tests and we needed to go to high input, I contacted as the CDC director companies like Roche to try to get their high throughput machines into the public health labs across the country. And guess what? They didn't have any available. Wow. You know, it was a six months to a year waiting list to get these machines on board in our public health lab. So we have to build that public health resilience, both right. in in, in, in equipment, um, but also, uh, you know, you can't do it if you don't have the technical team that you require. So I actually think a, a lot of redundancy needs to come into the system. Uh, you can divert that redundancy to doing diagnostics for chronic disease when we don't have pandemics, but you need to be able to reprogram that uh, redundancy for a pandemic disease. So again, the United States is not prepared we're not prepared. I, people know that I believe the great pandemic is coming. Uh, it's not COVID. I call, I call that the lesser pandemic. The great pandemic is coming. It's going to be a bird flu pandemic. It's going to be rough. Uh, we're going to see some significant mortality around the world, including the United States. It's not going to distinguish between different people 
who's going to have a bad outcome, like COVID had a bad outcome for those of us that are over 60, 70, 80. Uh, the bird flu, when it comes, it's going to have a, a bad outcome from children, for adolescents, for people in, the, in their 20s and their 30s, 40s, 50s. It's going to be problematic. The good news is we have the mRNA technology, so we'll be able to make a vaccine pretty quickly. The bad news is we'll never be able to make enough vaccine for 350 million people quick enough because we haven't built the redundancy in being able to convert that science to products for the American public. And the bad news is we still haven't built the redundancy for diagnostics. Uh, yeah, a lot I of science, here to answer your question, a lot of science to make, the scientific ability to make unique novel diagnostics and get them done is 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 really here, you know, and, 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 and but the reality is the op, how to operationalize that in real time those systems aren't there. I call on the United States, just like we've done for the Defense Department. We have long-term private-public partnerships with Boeing and Northrop, IBM, and others. That again, going back to my my point of view, that the uh, risk for pandemics is far greater than the risk of North Korea or the risk of Iran or the risk of Russia and the risk of China to change our way of life. And if we, we got a little taste of it with COVID, but we haven't gotten anything compared to what, and we should be over investing in our ability to rapidly respond to minimize the ability of that uh, threat on our way of life to having an impact. And sadly to this day, we're not over investing in it. I appreciate the, the discussion and investment and need for investment and call out for need for investment in both I think all the people, the process, the technology, um, the treatment and the diagnostic side, talking specifically about the people and on the leadership side, you've mentioned a couple of times throughout the meeting or throughout this conversation of meetings in the White House and meetings with very high profile, high sort of stress situations. There's been a lot of talk lately about clinician burnout and burnout of leaders, mainly in the healthcare delivery system. It sounds like from what you're talking about, there's definitely that same or maybe more intensity on the public health side. How are public health leaders holding up under the constant pressure faced today? Well, I think it's very, very hard. As I said, the men and women at CDC, which I got to know, uh, many of which had worked there for over 20 years when I got there, some over 30 years, uh, dedicated public health servants. Um, I really think they got numbed to the frustration that they never had the resources they needed to do to do their job. It'd be like we had a defense department and we put them out in the desert and, and, and we told them, you know, we gave them enough water for 1% of them and we gave them enough ammunition for 1% of them. So they, I think a lot of them uh, got lulled into the fact that they just were, underfunded for the mission. And so when you're underfunded for the mission, then it can start to make you believe that maybe the mission isn't as important to some people as it really is. So the CDC, you know, I think rapidly spent more time being come historic and using the data for historic purposes than they did using the data for immediate response. And I'm a big advocate to help the agency get realigned to be a public health response agency, not a public health historical agency. And I think that is something that really needs to happen if we're going to prepare ourselves uh, over the next decade. Um, and, you know, I think uh, the hardest thing uh, in Curse COVID being a great example was, you know, the constant negative criticism you know you've heard it on the news probably over and over and over and over again about the the defective cdc test for covid well that's not really true and everybody knew it wasn't true but it didn't stop them from saying cdc botched the test i mean the real truth if people want to know the truth was that the sequence of the virus was published on january 10th and before january 17th my scientists at CDC had developed a test. A single week. In, in seven to 10 days, okay? And that test worked. And that's how we diagnosed the original case. Now, some of the problems with the test was in order for the public health department to get the test, they had to send the blood to CDC, right? So that's a reality. 
And that test worked perfectly on the 17th, 18th of January, and it works perfectly today. And there never was a time in America when that test wasn't available to any health department to diagnose any patient at any time. But you wouldn't get that from the news when they say botched test, failed test, all this. What CDC did do, which again, I think was uh, uh, not optimal, is they got a lot of complaints from the health departments around the country that they lost, you know, three, four, five, three or four weeks or two weeks by having to send the blood to CDC. Would CDC prepare the reagents for the tests they developed, which we didn't patent, which we published, showed everyone how to do it? We actually thought all the hospitals around the country would just mimic the test because we told them exactly what prime repairs to use, exactly how to do it. Uh, we didn't realize that the FDA was coming down hard on what they call laboratory developed test and, and was threatening to uh, uh, cite anyone that used these tests that hadn't been FDA authorized. Although I will tell you, having ran many laboratory over the years, I developed many laboratory te developed tests and I used them for the benefit of my patients. I think that was another big flaw in that early response was the FDA's perspective on laboratory developed tests so that that not only the private sector wasn't involved, the whole medical system didn't use their molecular biology labs. But that, what CDC did was they then decided to make the primer pairs for the test and then give them to the states so they could actually do the tests themselves based on our protocol. But and that would have been fine, even though I would have rather them do what they, in my view, should have done and what they did afterwards is, is contract with a contractor who's a professional contractor in developing these reagents and have them develop the reagents and then give them to the states rather than have CDC, which is not a contracting production group. But the third thing CDC did which I disagreed with, they felt since this test now was leaving CDC, the mothership, rather than have two primer pairs to define a positive, they were gonna add a third primer pair. So they added a third primer pair and then they sent those three primer pairs to the states to see if they could validate the assay. And of course, within 24 to 48 hours, my phone was ringing constantly from my state colleagues telling me the test wasn't performing, they were getting false positives. And why did they get false positives? Well, it turns out the third primer pair was didn't work. Now, the FDA will argue that it was contaminated. I argued that it probably had, a, they had to consider that it could have a design flaw so that the primer pair annealed on itself, and that would give you a false positive. After a lot of investigation, it turns out that I can't rule out that there wasn't some contamination in the third primer pair, but I can say we definitely definitively showed that the primer pair's design was flawed and caused self annihilation. So despite the CDC, I would argue CDC should have gotten uh, like a medal for creating a test in seven days. I mean, it took us three years to get a test for HIV. I was involved in that. We did it in seven to 10 days. And yet what we got was just night after night after night of negative criticism. So when you ask about holding up when you're you know, working seven days a week, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, these people are not overpaid. And then you come home at night and just get constant criticism from Monday night quarterbacks, people not in the arena. It is demoralizing. You got to really go deep and understand why you do what you do. I can tell you, my family had no interest in me continuing at CDC. They constantly said uh, I should stay, you know, resign. I'm just getting beat up every night on the news. And of course, I felt that I was um, highly um, skilled to do the job and I was doing a, a, a good job and, and trying to maximize our response to this pandemic. And, and, you know, uh, and, you know, so what if people want to criticize? I mean, you know, many things. You heard the vaccine, you heard about the, the testing we just talked about, the other criticism, you know, you had, you know, Fauci and, and you had Atlas and others telling the president that we were going to have herd immunity. 
And I'm a virologist and I was trying to say, no, we're not gonna have herd immunity. Herd immunity is not operational for this virus because when you get this virus, you get immunity, but it's short lived and then you can get reinfected. If we have a vaccine, the vaccine's gonna mimic natural infection. It's gonna be short lived. So you know, stop this idea of herd immunity and get prepared for recurrent surges of this pandemic and try to keep the, the capability of the United States particularly in vaccine development, keep it moving forward. I mean, when we did Operation Warp Speed, very proud that before I left, we had three approved vaccines. Um, but what should have happened uh, was there should have never been a stop about creating additional vaccines with new antigens because this virus was gonna continue to evolve and it was gonna continue to get less and less impacted by vaccination. And instead, the, the common argument that was made by the other experts was, no, 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 we're gonna have herd immunity. You know, once 30% of the population's vaccinated or infected, we're fine. Once 50%, va fine. Once 70%, we're fine. You know, finally, in the last um, four months, uh, the leading spokespeople for the administration have finally stated that there is not herd immunity for this virus. Well, you know, many of us in the public health arena said that two and a half years ago. So I do think that's what causes frustration. Um, that's what causes burnout. Um, but on the other hand, there's so many great moments in public health that I've seen, you know, when we had the individuals that were developing, you know, severe lung disease from vaping, how CDC right. went in and figured that out within weeks, or how we saw children that were getting some illness that looked like polio and caused them paralysis and we figured that out in about a year, uh, how some people were bleeding to death in the Midwest and no one understood why they were bleeding to death. Young, healthy people come in bleeding to death and we found out it's because synthetic marijuana was contaminated with a product that blocked their blood from clotting. Terrifying. So these, you know, the, and the people that do this work and figure this out is exciting. But um, I do think it's been a hard time, you know, it was a hard time when I was there. It's been even worse since I've left the amount of public criticism that the public health community continues to get. Uh, and you're gonna see more criticism now with the monkeypox. You know, we had a chance to probably contain monkeypox, but that's gone now. Um, you know, monkeypox is unfortunately going to be a significant sexually transmitted disease. Uh, it's not going to affect everyone. It's going to be probably contained to sexual transmission and people that have multiple sexual contacts, gay community first. We're starting to see spillover into the population, but it, it won't be, you know, huge. It will be similar to what uh, we've seen with some other STDs. But we did have a chance when it first came to diagnose it, vaccinate around it, and shut it down. Now that we're seeing secondary cases already in the community, you know, I think we've lost that. This is going to become another STD that we're going to have to confront. Uh, my biggest concern is that as it gets established as an STD, this virus will actually infect rodents and then redefine a natural reservoir for pox virus in the United States and Europe. You know, what had been contained in Africa for so many, so many years is now gonna be, uh, you know, it's ironic. It's the opposite of what people were arguing about SARS and MERS, where it went from a bat to an animal to humans. This is one that's gonna be amplified in humans and then go back. <laughs> human to animal and back? Yeah, human to animal and back. <laughs> Interesting, that's, uh, I, I have new fears now, so thank you for that. Um, I also really appreciate how you articulated around funding and mission and how even if you don't have the funding, the mission doesn't change, but it can feel like it changed or can feel like it's not perceived as valuable. I think that is such a, a great uh, reflection on the burnout and I think some have called it moral injury in both the healthcare delivery system and certainly the public health system. Really appreciate the, the discussion around the challenges. And certainly there's challenges that have been, there are challenges that are, and it sounds like there's certainly potentially more difficult challenges in the future. All of that, and you still sound upbeat, you still put in the long days and the hours. Um, and we, we probably have to apologize from your family uh, that the, the public health work keeps you at it. It sounds like they've tried to pull you away. All of that, what are you optimistic about or what keeps you optimistic? 
Well, I think the real basis for my optimism is I have total confidence in the power of science. I think I think people I've said this before. My father was a scientist. He went from Hopkins to University of Chicago to NIH back in the late 40s uh, from his group. He died, unfortunately, in 1956, but his group produced three independent individuals that won the Nobel Prize in medicine. So these guys played the game as good as it could be played. My mother was a scientist after he died at NIH, and she did a lot of work learning how our body makes proteins. I have enormous confidence in science. And when you see the advancements in science that we're seeing, uh, you know, a good example is the mRNA vaccine, something that I worried about as CDC director. If we had a bird flu pandemic, I knew it was gonna take me at least a year to get a vaccine. And we would just be doing body counts. All right now with the mRNA technology, I can probably get a vaccine made within two to four weeks. Oh. Right now, I don't have the manufacturing capability in the United States to make sure all, all the American public and the broader world gets access to it. And this is where I think we should have some redundancy. You know, I, I, I keep going back to the military analogy. We invest a lot of money in the Defense Department. But I will argue that the greater threat is 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 now is is pandemics. And we should have a proportional investment in our capacity to, uh, you know, we have a lot of money invested in uh, our contractors being able to make ammunitions uh, if they need to and expand. Well, we should have that same full capability for, for vaccines and biologics. So I have so much confidence in science, what I've seen science accomplish, uh, that I, I'm just very optimistic. Um, I about the power of science. I've always said the one thing I, you know, we come back to the vaccination. I always try to remind people the vaccination, in my view, is the most powerful gift of science to modern medicine. And it frustrates me when it's on the shelf and not being used. And that's why when I had to decide what I was going to do when I left, I decided I was going to create a company that was going to try to figure out how to make sure poor and median income countries get access to vaccines. And that's what I'm trying to do and do it in a sustainable, scalable way. The current approach that we have for vaccines for the developing world is we give them away as donations. That's not scalable, right? It's not sustainable, right? We've never tried to vaccinate the entire population. We've always done kids in a, in a, in a, in a charity giveaway. And I've tried to you know, explain that that is not a strategy that's going to get us to be able to exploit vaccines for the, the broader population that needs it. And what happens when we rely on that strategy is we have huge portions of the world that don't have equitable access to vaccines. Well, Dr. Redfield, there's infinite demands on your time. And uh, we're so appreciative that you took a little bit of that to spend with us today. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Alex. I enjoyed it. God bless. And as a, a listener and a viewer, there's also infinite demands on your time. So thank you so much for listening and participating. We can't wait to continue creating a healthier future with you. There's so many real challenges in the world. We hope wherever you are, there are ways to find and be the good around you. We welcome you to the conversation at our email address, the Health Pulse Podcast at sas.com, and down here in the comments on YouTube. Thank you.